All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, really appreciate we're trying a, a new time slot here to see what kind of gathering we can pull together. Um, something that we want to start doing, you know, at least two times a year um, of really getting a chance to talk about where the program is um, and where college soccer is and where, you know, where we are within that landscape and, and really trying to include alums in, in what we're doing as a team, what we're trying to build as a program. Um, and I think, you know, as, as we kind of talk through some of these things here, kind of lead up to the idea of um, why our alumni and our larger Davidson soccer family should be such not just a strength, but a competitive advantage for us. Um, and how we put more focus into that and try to build that out. And, and, you know, I think especially within the world of college athletics, now it's such an opportunity for us to be different. Um, and I think to be really great at what matters. Um, so the idea here is just want to kind of walk through, um, you know, I'm sure some of you pay attention to college soccer, but there, there are a lot of trends that I think are worth sharing and talking about um, and, and just kind of going through. And we have a few, I'm sure that we're on the call in August. Um, I've got a couple slides that will be a repeat of what we did that then, but also some, uh, some additional ones uh, that will, uh, I, I think, kind of show the direction of where a lot of programs are going and where, where we exist within, um, within the whole college soccer landscape. So um, I'm going to pull up some slides here. See how I'll, uh, I am getting better at navigating this stuff, but still. There we go. Where's my view? Okay. All right. Um, so just to kind of quickly talk through um, where college soccer is, and I think we've got players and alums from a lot of different generations and things have, have shifted, uh, you know, in my time as a college coach over 20 years. Um, things have gotten a lot different over the past, I'd say five to six, um, especially with how many youth players are signing pro contracts. And, you know, if you go back to like even the mid nineties, early two thousands, all the best domestic players played college soccer. And now that, that doesn't happen with uh, a large percentage of them, whether they go through the MLS Academy and sign a contract, or maybe they, um, they play a year or two and then they leave. So like, if you look at, you know, the one site that rates the top uh, domestic recruits in 2022, 33 of the 50 top players didn't go to college soccer. Um, the last, and this was before this year, but uh, the last six ACC rookies of the year signed pro before finishing their sophomore year. Um, and then... You look at the international impact, which has been massive. Uh, I'm sure all of you played with or against internationals in your time, but it has been flooded with um, players who have kind of maxed out internationally. There are these agencies everywhere that will help place them uh, at a place in the U.S. and a college in the U.S. And most of them with the idea of they want to keep playing and, you know, the hope of playing professionally in the U.S education being secondary for a lot of them but um like marshall won a national championship two years ago with uh, 11 of 12 players who played in that game being international um and then you kind of add in the other layer of the transfer portal which i think you read about in all other sports uh you look at uh unc's roster um this was uh what two falls ago um they had eight grad players, they had nine internationals, they had six transfers. Uh, and, and one of the things that we live with now that uh, will go away in two years is the COVID year. Uh, not having 
grad school um, where a lot of these other programs can pick up players for one year. And, you know, we've certainly, we've had some of our guys go on to play an additional year uh, that we've sort of, you know, looking at the, I think looking at it from the perspective of what's best for them, helping them find a fifth year where they could get a grad degree and go play at a good program. Because coming back for an extra semester of undergrad isn't, isn't really going to benefit them um, when they've got this extra year. But the, the last COVID class with that year of eligibility is this year. Uh, this year's senior, so that it'll it'll still be a factor in in, uh, in college soccer for another uh, two seasons. Um, all right, and just kind of quickly going through like the twenty, and you can I try to color code it just so you get an idea of the impact. The All Americans in twenty one, um, all the Blues are internationals, um, and I I kind of denoted in red where there were transfers. Um, so you see, I think it's seven of 11 in the first team were international. Um, and then, you know, on the far right, so the, um, kind of top domestic, uh, you know, the all Americans who were underclassmen, uh, most of them signed pro after they had an all American season. So it's, it's a really, it's a interesting landscape. And you kind of see all of these trends, which exist outside of what we are. Um, and the bold programs, and I'll kind of uh, come back to this in a, another slide or two, like University of Washington, Georgetown, uh, Wake Forest, Notre Dame, tend to be, uh, Stanford being another one, um, tend to be domestic uh, four-year education-driven development programs, which uh, you know, I, I'll show as we go on here that that model also succeeds, but there just aren't many programs that are doing it. Um, looking at and just at this past season, that was from the previous was from 21. Um, I, again, this year, eight of the 12 first team All Americans were internationals. There were four domestic first team All Americans, there was one four year senior that was a, a first team all American, which is pretty crazy. I think for a lot of you, if you think back to when you played, how many fourth year seniors would have been all Americans. There was one fifth year senior and then the two underclassmen domestic all Americans, um, both signed pro after the season. Um, so Syracuse won the national championship this year. And just to kind of show you how, um, quickly impactful the international transfer system can be for some programs. You look at the two years previous to winning a national championship, they they struggled. Uh, they were two, seven and four, then eight, eight and two. And then this past year they were 19, two and four. They they brought in um a number of transfers, but one NAIA player who uh, I think scored, you know, 11 and 11 goals and had seven assists and another transfer who was playing in his fourth program in four years who put up about the same numbers and uh you know anytime you transfer in 22 goals your your win loss is probably going to go up a decent amount and they ended up winning the national championship they had 14 internationals and 12 transfers on their team so it's it's just a different world when you look at what some teams are doing and and how the um opportunities have opened up in the international the transfer markets uh it, but you know with that we kind of get to where the opportunity exists for us with all of these programs kind of shifting their focus um and looking at the atlantic 10 here um pretty similar 14 of 22 international players were on the all a 10 team Five of the 22 were transfers. 10 of the 22 were graduate players. Uh, St. Louis won it this year. They had seven transfers that played for them in their tournament games. They had five internationals. Um, so, you know, pretty consistent with the dominant trends. Um, and then looking at the, like I referenced, the, the teams that, um, you know, kind of despite the success of some of these other programs have stayed true to what they believe is going to make them more successful. Uh, Georgetown, who was very good as they always are, and 
only went to the second round this year, but they usually go well beyond that. No international players, one graduate, no transfers. Uh, Stanford, pretty similar. They had a couple internationals, no transfers. Um, and then Indiana is, they're a little bit, you know, I wouldn't say they're, you know, at the kind of highly selective um, admissions of Georgetown and Stanford, but still kind of stick to their model of solid Midwest players, um, develop them, build them for four years. A lot of guys who don't play for a year or two and then really start to impact as they, as they get into their junior and senior year. Um, so getting to us uh, and, and just kind of uh, looking back for, you know, I'm sure a lot of you maybe got a chance to watch a game, maybe, uh, you know, maybe just kind of followed through some of the emails or, or uh, results. But, um, you know, this year for us, we started one, five and one, um, scored one goal against in our first uh, against our first six division one opponents. Um, very different than the previous year when we had nine seniors and came into a season with a very experienced team as far as just knowing how to get results. Um, the the kind of trends that we just talked about um, in this past fall when we were playing a very young team in the first the first month, um, you know, it, it ended up costing us a lot in results, not that we weren't in games, but we just didn't know how to win them. Um, and then, you know, it, I think the big thing being that we had the talent and we have the talent, but team um, had to learn. So second half of the season, we go five, three and two, we beat Virginia tech. Um, we beat UMass and URI in the last two games who were two of the top teams in the league. Um, and in our last game, every player on the field that started for us was an underclassman. Uh, two freshmen scored the goals uh, against the team that was full of uh, fifth and sixth year players. Um, so a lot of a lot of good momentum and I think investment and development of some really good players as we head into 23. Um, and you know, I, with our model, and I, and I think, you know, it's everyone's busy. It's tough to really follow game to game um, and kind of see the development of some of our guys. But the past two years, we've had the leading freshman scorer in the conference. Um, Dennis, this past season, scored nine goals as a freshman. He was a freshman All-American. And then Vinny uh, came into the season injured, and uh, it took him a little bit to get going, never really – say fully hit form, but he had seven goals as a freshman. We bring both those guys back. Yeah, it'll be junior and sophomore this year. All of our starters coming back. We've got three guys in the back line that have started every game. They've been healthy over their three-year careers. Um, and a number of guys in the senior class who I think, should they choose to, have an opportunity to keep playing after they graduate. Um, the development in our roster over the past few years we have six seniors who've played significant roles over the past uh, three seasons. Uh, the the rising juniors, we've had six guys who every one of them contributed to the team last year. Um, a number of them, after not having played a lot as freshmen, really stepping in and, and growing and, and impacting the team uh, as sophomores. Um, in the rising sophomore class, I mean, we've got some players in the sophomore class who I think are true difference makers, um, guys that could play anywhere. Um, and in the freshman class coming in, that we've got a few more guys that I feel are at that level. Um, I mean, we've got, you know, if we were to highlight two of the guys coming in, the one, uh, our one player from Atlanta, um, we committed and I guess found before Atlanta United found them. And he he has since been brought in to play for Atlanta United. Um, and talking to their head of recruiting, they feel that he's the best player in Georgia. Um, our, our one center mid from San Diego has been one of the best players in the ECNL over the past couple of years. I think he's going to be a pretty exceptional um, center mid for us. 
Uh, and the other guys, I, I think, all have a chance to to be impactful the way that some of these um, upperclassmen or, well, sophomores and juniors have over the past few years. Uh, and looking at us, we we had one international last year. Uh, we're down to zero. We have no transfers in. Um, and, and one of the things that, you know, I think that uh, – I want alums to understand and what we tell our recruits and our model is in recruiting against other schools is we want them to look at our roster year to year and see that every one of our players is coming back, um, that we're developing guys within our roster. And part of that is we don't really shop in the transfer market. If there's someone that pops up that could be a really good fit for us, that's great. But it eliminates opportunities and incentives for development for your younger players if they know that you're actively out there looking for for transfers to come in. You know, say if you're the this, you know, the second right back and the right back's graduating, and then you're bringing in a transfer above him when he thinks it's his opportunity. We believe that it's really important within our culture that guys understand that. They come in here because we see a path forward for them, and that path isn't really going to change within the roster. Um, and then summer development. Uh, we've got this this summer, almost our entire team is going to play in the USL too. Um, and I think it's become kind of a, something within our roster as far as the ambition of guys getting into really competitive rosters or really competitive USL two teams like Nico Cavallo was in the championship game last year, starting at left back with uh, Long Island. He'll go back there this year. Um, Vinny uh, or uh, sorry, Dennis and Alonzo, who were two uh, played the most as freshmen this year going up to Vermont which is one of the best USL two and I mean places that recruit the best players in the country. We've got three guys going to Mississippi. We've got two guys playing for Carolina SC. We've got one guy playing out in Arizona. I, it's really kind of exciting to see. And this is what mid-majors have to do to compete, that they guys have to get in the competitive environments in the summer because the power fives, a lot of most of them have summer school and they bring their guys in and they develop them that way. And our guys need to get into a different environment. And I think also learn that they're just as good as those players, that they're just as good as power five players or ACC players when they're playing on the same team and hopefully taking minutes from them. Um, so this is something I just, uh, I'll, I'll go through fairly quickly, but it, it kind of leads up to one of the things that uh, we want to talk about when um, I introduce uh, Tim after I, I'm done speaking, but um, in recruiting for us, and you, you know, this is probably for a lot of you when you were looking at schools and, um, you know, kind of thinking about what would be the best fit. Um, you know, we come up against the Ivies, we come up against power fives, we come against mid majors. And you kind of look at the different areas as far as, you, you know, who's gonna be a Davidson player. Um, competitiveness of the program, they want to see that we're playing good teams. They want to see that we win. Um, being around our players and kind of getting a sense for how we train and, and um, you know, what the level is. You know, I think we keep increasing that every year. Um, I think our style of play is becoming a lot, you know, just more attractive year by year, hopefully more attack oriented. Um, you know, you, you look against, like if we go against an Ivy League school, um, you know, education, it's maybe there's a branding issue there with some of these guys thinking that an Ivy is better, but there certainly isn't any substantive difference. Um, and a lot of guys see that. Um, some Ivies can package a little better in certain situations than we can financially. And, and I'll show you an example of how we can, uh, we can package better than, uh, than Ivies and even mid-majors and power fives and, and a lot of, uh, a lot of situations. Um, and you just kind of like scan across where, you know, we're going to compete in schools, power five. Um, it's all going to be about our culture. It's going to be about the Davidson campus, our community, our locker room is going to be what separates us from those places. Um, mid majors, 
pretty much the same thing. And, you know, I think in a lot of those, we have an educational advantage um, where, you know, we, if a player is more educationally focused, then we can win a lot of those battles just on that. But then, you know, you, there, there always are the financial components and, um, and then competitively we're keep, we keep pushing to be one of the elite mid majors. Um, so this is something I just thought, you, you know, I, and I'll, I'll walk through it just because it, everyone knows that scholarship is, is our issue, right? I mean, we're, as far as being able to compete, um, I mean, we've, we've got about two endowed scholarships. We can get a little above that in some ways, but obviously when other schools have 9.9, um, it can make it tough if you get into a recruiting battle where cost is a real issue for the family. So the the first example I want to show you is just that, well, you know, on the outside, if you look at just just the the numbers and say we only have two two and a half scholarships, we can stretch that to be a lot more. So if we if we find a player who is admissible, who's high need, so say in um, in this instance he he's going to qualify for. 80% need. Um, Ivies will meet about the same as that. That'll be, we'll, we'll be even with them in those situations. But we can add our athletic aid on top of that. So in this situation, if we find someone who qualifies for 80% need, and then we can put 20% athletic on top of that, which is only 8% of our total uh, scholarship, right? And we've got a player who's on a full ride. And for a place like UNC or Clemson, they get into the equivalency issue of that, where if they want to compete financially with us in those situations, they probably have to give a full scholarship. And that's one of their 10. And for them to value a player at that level, that's, that's a very significant investment. Um, so it's a real incentive for us to go out and find players of different backgrounds who we can package and stack in these ways, because one, I think is a cultural thing for us. Most of these players we're finding and introducing to Davidson. I, I don't know how many alums you targeted Davidson, you know, you knew of it and, and came and visited and had an interest right away. You know, a, a lot of the players that we've been able to find, it's they didn't know Davidson existed. They didn't know that, you know, a small school that competed at a high level that could offer this type of aid was out there. Um, and, you know, I think it, it adds a lot to our locker room, um, bringing people from different parts of the country, different backgrounds. And, you know, obviously it's a way for us to compete and find great players and, and be able to offer them. A pretty life-changing package um and then you look at the you know the second player where we really it, it's always going to be difficult for us where they say have no need and you know some of others you know other schools can offer them you know some or you know a significant amount and for us we can't really move the needle a whole lot if we're trying to cut into the, uh, you know, now close to $80,000 price tag. Um, we still find families where, the, you know, we can give them some scholarship and it becomes um, a very, it, it's still the right fit for them. But we, we come across a lot where financially it becomes difficult because some of the other schools who are maybe able to uh, package academic merit money with scholarship um or they can just go straight scholarship and we we have a tough time competing um so just wanted to kind of give you that um you know i think more as a, a sense of like we can compete we we can find players from different backgrounds and package things in different ways where we're playing with a lot more than two scholarships and we can get some pretty special players, you know, in uh, of all different backgrounds. But you know, the 
the source of it mostly for us is we've got to be able to go out there and find them. Uh, we've got to find them before other schools do. Um, so getting to kind of the, the idea of fit, and, and one of the things I'm going to tee Tim up to talk about a little bit as far as where we really believe we're different than other programs. Um, really trying to invest in player and personal development. And, you know, the idea and, you know, so it's funny and, you know, I hopefully a lot of, you know, you guys will be able to reflect on this as well. Um, like I was talking with the assistant coaches the other day of, you know, that first conversation you have with players of like, how can you tell someone is a Davidson fit? And um, I think after my second, third year here, it was always someone who is relationship focused, who wants to know other people, who wants other people to know them, who wants to be engaged, doesn't want to be anonymous in big classroom or big lecture halls. And that's what we've sold as our biggest differentiator. Um, and I don't know uh, the if any of you have read the um, about the the Harvard study over the past eighty years of the book that just came out and talking about the, like the longest study in in human happiness, um, and it's it's all about positive relationships. And you know, I so I to me it was this idea of like we always had this idea of what makes us different, what we believe in, what we love to do. And then to kind of see this validated in a sense of, well, this is actually like the most important fundamental thing in people's lives as far as living happy lives is building and sustaining positive relationships. And, you know, I think it's what Davidson's all about. And I think it's something that, you know, I've talked about with Jared and Jesse and Tim of how we can lean into that even more, how we can build that within our locker room, which, you know, in some ways it's self-selecting that I think we have people that come here that want to do that, but then how we can, how we can facilitate it, not just within the team, but within the alumni community as well. Um, and then just the, the idea of player and personal development. And I think, uh, you know, really what we want alums to feel proud of as much as the results is that, this is, I mean, this is our purpose. Right? This is what we want to invest resources in. This is where we want to be great. So in the fundraising over the past few years, adding a second full-time assistant, just having someone else who can be out on the field, who's, and we, you know, we brought in, and Jared is 32, Jesse's 26. Jesse's a lot closer to the players, age, like just a, much easier person for them to go to and talk to about things, I think is is huge within a locker room. Um, we've, the, you know, within kind of our extended support staff, Megan has been our trainer almost since I got here and will be for a long time. And Jamie is our strength coach and he's going to be with us for a long time. So we've got people who are very aligned and committed to, you know, they're going to be with our players for four years. Um, and then as we kind of move into, uh, what Tim's going to talk about and, you know, the idea of, uh, you know, within division one, another resource, uh, that's being added to power five and, you know, bigger programs is it, and even some teams in our conferences, now you can have three full-time assistants and, you know, we've kind of scrapped to get to two. Um, but even in thinking about what that third assistant looks like and, you know, Tim getting to know Tim when he came back to the area and his involvement with the team. And really we've been trying to find a way that he can get more involved in a meaningful way, which I think he's got incredible capacity for, um, and working with guys on an individual basis. Um, and you know, this idea of kind of personal and performance coaching that he's going to talk through is, is something that we, we want to add and enhance within our our program and it you know in a way that's unique to us and that i think is going to be a unique um just 
asset to every every player that comes through our program in a very personal way. Um, and then, you know, I think we'll we'll talk about how we can bring the alum alumni community into that as well. Um, so just as I kind of wrap up my piece, and we will, you know, we we want to open it up for anyone who has questions at the end, but you kind of want to get the um the uh, information and just kind of the updates out to you and then see what um what you're curious about. But really, you know, appreciate everyone checking in here. It means a lot that you still care about it and you still want to be involved in it. And, you know, we talk about the ideas of, okay, well, how, how can we really build the connectivity of kind of the larger family is tuning into games, finding opportunities to come to game, reaching out to me, reaching out to the coaching staff, if you are coming to a game so that we can stop and, and talk. And, you know, I think for me, it's always so fun when you meet somebody who say, in a certain field and we've got a guy who is you know studying to go in banking studying to go into medical school and like well all right well you got to talk to you know you've got to meet jackson or you know bringing these people together and and that's where we should be we should be the best um and then just um you know participating like the the events we do and i think we're we keep refining what we want to do virtually and and how we can get alums connected with players and get conversations going um the alumni game as much as people can make an effort and you know this year i think we're going to try uh we're going to keep trying to add layers that make it more fun and engaging to come back to so you know we're going to have like we did last year the small sided tournament where we kind of mix the alums and the current players um we'll have a social afterward and, and then you know based on attendance if we get really good numbers coming in i think trying to maybe facilitate some ways for um alums and players to engage and get to know each other um tim will talk about the idea of mentorships within the team uh for those who you know want to stay involved and in kind of in, in knowing the guys that are coming through our program um and i think you know just largely for everyone that's involved in this program really um believing that this this is what makes us unique um our community and our relationships but it's also what can help us win you know we are here to compete as well as give this experience that is something that stays with everyone for the rest of their lives and then hopefully with you know everyone ultimately graduating wanting to give back and stay involved. Um, so, so with that, I'm going to, I'm going to turn it over to Tim. And I, I think a lot of, you know, Tim Halfrich, who's been involved with the program for the past few years, um, but is, is now dedicating more time. And I think we've uh, really carved out a specific role where he can, he can really add to the experience of, of our players and, and hopefully, you know, kind of part of that is connecting the alumni community with with our players um so tim if you're ready i will always ready mike mute myself and turn it over to you okay thank you all again for for being here i'll, I'll try to be quick because i know we've been talking at you for a while um I'm Tim Elford, as Mike said. I'm a I'm a 2000 graduate of of Davidson, having played some soccer when I was on campus. Um, have mostly lived in Davidson since graduating, and have been a part of the team since 2020 in a volunteer capacity. And and Mike and I have had a lot of conversations over the last four years, ultimately about the stuff he's talked about. How do we understand who we are as a program? How we want to add value to our students while they're here and for their lives beyond and how we can engage alumni in, in that exercise. And so I'll share a little bit about a program that we are launching presently. We announced it to the team two weeks ago and it's just getting underway now, but um, effectively launching a program that's that's currently called the LEAP program, but it's in, engaging students in um, leadership, entrepreneurship and, and peak performance and sort of scaffolding in some resources, um, some workshops, and some one-on-one -on -one coaching 
um, that helps to uh, develop skills in these and, and use them to a competitive advantage while they're on campus and, and beyond. Um, I'm not going to read from the slides uh, again, try to be quick so that you guys can ask some questions, but effectively what we're trying to do with this program is, is lean into our competitive advantage, lean into everything that Davidson stands for um, and do something that no one else in college soccer is doing, um, uh, you know, and so, but, but also being true to, to the history of the program. So I don't want to shortchange that. I think Davidson soccer has been developing leaders um, and, and the coaches are already resourcing our players in, in towards peak performance. And I think we have a long history of entrepreneurs in the program. That's, that's interesting to lean into. Um, but uh, you know, the, the goal is to, you know, how, how, how well aligned can we be as a team on what our purpose is? How intentional can we be in resourcing our players individually and collectively to, um, to ladder up to that purpose? Um, what are the shared language, shared tools, shared frameworks for understanding what we're trying to do, what our objectives are? Again, in a way that it's all about balancing how to add value to our players when they're here in a way that extends beyond the time that they're here and in a way that creates a competitive advantage. We want to check all those boxes. Um, and part of this strategy, as Mike alluded to, is, is, in, is energizing and engaging our alumni, both for ongoing financial support in the ways that we're trying to resource our players. Uh, so I think our resource of alums in terms of their own skills and their own passions and their own connection to our program is, is already a competitive advantage and, and can be. And so this is a program that also is intended to embrace that and um, expand upon that um, through you know engagement opportunities like the alumni game, but also through some mentorship, which I will touch on just briefly. Um, so the scope of the program is, it, it is rooted a little bit in, in, well, not a little bit, it's rooted a lot in one-on-one -on -one personal development coaching. So I am in the process, actually, sidebar of launching a, a professional coaching business. And so this folds into that a little bit, but it would be one-on-one -on -one coaching with all the players, um, four or five times a year, um, not on tactical and technical aspects of soccer, but on life and leadership and their own passions and their own habits and, and how they can flourish um, while on our campus, while in our program. Um, combining those one-on-one -on -one sessions with team workshops where we're having those same conversations, but on a team level, um, you know, very values-oriented, purpose-driven um, workshops, um, a two-day preseason retreat, which we're hoping to do in Asheville to line up with our, our last preseason game, which will be at UNCA. Um, we announced a new leadership council last week that I'll be facilitating throughout the year to really make sure we have strong player voice consistently. Um, and again, that we are, as a leadership council, really working between the players and the captains and four or five other players from undergraduate, from underclassmen years uh, participating in that to make sure we're developing skills, shared language, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, again, layering the alumni into this. What are the ways that we connect our alumni to our players um, collectively um, when it makes sense um, to have alumni come in and share their stories and, and their leadership and entrepreneurship and performance, and as well as just connecting people one-on-one -on -one through mentorship. Uh, Bruce, Bruce uh, Nofsinger did some work a couple of years ago to, to try to start a mentorship program that, that we are hoping to, um, to, to jump back into. Um, and I'll, I'll move through this part pretty quickly, but it's just kind of an articulation of, of the combination of, of the one-on-one -on -one sessions with uh, the workshops, um, with some service learning, tied into it. Um, so this is happening this spring. Um, Leadership Council will be driving the leader, the service projects. Uh, my individual sessions with the players will start on March 19th. Um, we'll have a couple of workshops as a group 
uh, before we go, just getting back to Mike's point that that the locker room really is our greatest competitive advantage. And, and so what are the ways that we can expand what the locker room means to our players um, and giving them skills to understand how to how to themselves lean into that? Um, the work will continue through the summer, onboarding some new players into our culture, um, continuing to work with the leadership council and the coaches, reading some books together, um, and then uh, heavy in the preseason. The goal is, is, is to do as much stuff before the season as possible so that in the competitive season, which, which you probably know, um, does not have a lot of downtime to it. Um, you know, we are either recovering from playing in or preparing for a competitive match. And so, you know, the goal is to use the spring, the summer, and the preseason to really get most of this stuff embedded into our program so that the fall can be a little bit more streamlined. Um, so again, some, some of the one-on-one -on -one coaching would continue in the fall. Leadership uh, service projects would continue in the fall and just some, some more huddling in a, in a preseason culture calibration. So um, I'm super excited about doing this work. I believe, you know, fully in what we're trying to do as a program and um, and Mike's vision and, and the current players that we have. I think it's an awesome time to launch this program. I think given the landscape of college soccer, given where Davidson is um, and given the strength of our alumni network, I think it all um, adds together to give us the potential to create something really special. So again, kind of breeze through it. Thanks for listening. Um, definitely open to some questions and, and hoping that this is something that um, again, we'll add value to our players. We'll add value to them when they are alums. We'll add value for you all as alums, giving you ways to connect with our players. Um, and, you know, your support of the program will, will be an integral part of its success. So I'll throw it back to you, Mike, if you want to facilitate a little bit of back and forth, but. Yeah. Yeah. Happy to, to open it up to more questions and the one you know thing I, i'll kind of say the you know summarize a bit um it, is it's interesting going around college soccer and talking to coaches from you know different size programs and everyone talking about the changing landscape and what it's going to look like and it's it's really nice to be at a place where you know that the mission and what we do is not going to change one bit regardless of what happens outside of us because i think all the people that come here all the people that are involved with this team believe in how this what this experience should be and how we should win more than you know just will we win so building this to win the right way, but then when we do win, um, I think having a really big community to share it with uh, is, you know, is what we want. Um, so, you know, I really, anyone who's got questions about any of the things we just talked about or unrelated, happy to open it up. I think you can just unmute and ask um, or put one in the chat room. Well, I, I'll ask a couple of questions, um, and I'm most interested just to hear about the program itself and would be happy to connect with current players in any way. So I, I don't know if you have kind of a list of people in their professions that if a student is interested in some particular area that you can already match them up. But uh, if you don't, I'd be happy to you know, be on a list, or if you do, I'd be happy to make sure I am on that list, which I don't know if I am yet. But um, outside of the program, I'm just kind of curious. I know there have been some talk about changing the calendar for college soccer to like a full year calendar. I guess the 21st century model maybe is mm -hmm. what I, I recall it being. Um, you know, I guess it, soccer's changed a lot since the mid-90s when I was there. But I just hate to think of more emphasis on sports 
sports and less emphasis on other aspects of the college experience. I'm just curious what your view is on that. I, I know that it would probably improve the level of soccer, but at the expense maybe of other aspects of college life. So I'm interested in that. And I'm also interested just in the, the team now being in the Atlantic 10, how does that travel impact the ability of students to also balance sports with other parts of college experience? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, as the, uh, the last question, the travel, it really isn't, isn't that bad considering we maybe have two to three flights. A year. It, it's something we've always been able to manage. I think there are a couple times in the year where it might get to be, um, you know, the schedule might get to be a little busy. Um, but to the 21st century model, um, it's an interesting thing that has been, um, you know, in discussion for a long time. Uh, and where it stands now, it was kind of like on the brink of being voted on, but then COVID happened. The NCAA, um, you know, I think uh, took a step back to kind of figure out the um, the larger scale issues, you know, NIL, player compensation, all of these things, and, and any sports-specific legislation just got pushed to the side. So, you know, the NCA is going to figure out how to restructure, and then I think it's going to resurface. Um, whether or not it it goes, I don't know. Um, my feeling on it is I, I love the spring season. I think it's been such a great opportunity for our guys, especially the ones who didn't play, to develop and to play in games. Um, I don't want it to be shifted more towards this idea of, you know, it's being led by some coaches who um, – see college soccer becoming less relevant as a pro development pathway, which it has. Um, and then there's also, you know, kind of the health concerns of playing too many games in a week and too many games in a condensed period of time. I, I wish this idea of, you know, pro pathway relevance would just go away because I don't think that that is what college soccer should be. Um, you know, if, in say two to three years, it does happen. Um, well, you know, I don't think it'll be as seismic as you would think on the outside. And I think we would make adjustments to, you know, make sure that the Davidson experience is still kind of what it should be. But yeah, yeah. well, I, I appreciate um, everything you've described is still kind of maintaining that balance of athletics and academics and social and all that. And I just hope that yeah, I, I'd encourage you to continue with that approach. That just sounds like the better way to me than more emphasis on athletics. I I agree. And I I'm I hope that some sanity kind of wins out in some of these battles as we go. But um, you know, I, I think we'll always find a way to kind of stay true to what we should be. Hey, Mike, to, to, uh, to Andy's sort of other comments, last question. I recall in years past, there was some sort of LinkedIn type system where we were able to yeah. register. Spear used to have a spreadsheet, but but is there something current where, you know, to the point about mentorship and career opportunities, we can all make sure we are available and connected with the right information? Yeah, yeah and, so, it, and I, I think, think it's one thing. Like Tim, if you want to go, you can. Yeah, I mean, so so we we have a survey that's that's kind of ready to go, and and so what our goal is is to share out a survey that goes in both directions, that goes to our our players and that goes to our alums, and that gives you know an opportunity to articulate what you know where you are, what your interest level is, how you would most like to engage with our players, what field you're in, and similarly with our players to articulate what they are looking for to gather that information, to understand who it is that's excited about this, and then to do some work to put some people together.
Yeah, and I would just say to that too is it, when I think we get results results from the survey and we come up with the path and the format that we want to be able to connect alums. You know, obviously this group checking in and um, you know I think being leaders as far as being engaged and then reaching out to others and, and trying to grow you know that level of connection. Um, you know, it's one thing I think coming here as the only non-Davidson coach and, um, you know, not kind of having the history um, and, you know, kind of in the process of building it as well. But, uh, you know, like the one of the things I love more than anything, like when we played in Fordham two years ago and um, I had, I think it was three of my former Chicago players who were all in finance and, and Gilly, who I think is on this call was looking to get in the finance and introduce him to those three guys. And I think he had two interviews within a week or two. And like, there's, there's part of it for me, I think, as I enter what I would consider the second phase of this, now that we've, you know, recruited and built a team is, is really finding ways to get to know more of the players that have played here, even though I didn't coach here and to build those relationships. And, you know, in that way, too, it's just anyone, you know, when we kind of get a system going to connect players with alums, but also any alum reach out is on campus, like, you know, please stop by, you know, call, check in. Um, it's just, you know, kind of building that network as we go along um, is, I, I think it's a real priority because I think it's, you know, the most enjoyable thing about being a part of an experience that, you know, should be about lifelong connections and relationships. Um, I'd like to offer just an observation and maybe a question as well. But um, I think it's, I remember my time at Davidson, my time through athletics and, and, I don't think it was unlike a lot of the guys I was in school with. We didn't really know exactly where we were going, what we were going to study. We were figuring it out as we go. And I applaud what you're doing with this step toward the program that Tim has outlined here, because I, I think Davidson would suffer if it already knew an admission of players that that was really what their focus was and their singular focus and that there wasn't an area that they needed to or areas that they needed to develop and improve and grow in and so I, I, again i think this is something that makes me very proud to be a davidson alum and i thank you for taking that step yeah thanks steve and if if anyone wants a scouting report on the current team, Steve would be a good guy to reach out to as he appears at uh, several afternoon practices. Um, so we we know you're going to be ready and willing to be involved. What is the uh, alumni game going to look like this year? Are we going full sided or kind of like last year, or what's what's the deal? Well, full sided was an exception last year when we had nine graduating seniors. So we're uh, I don't know if you guys are ready to reboot that game again, but I think we're gonna we're gonna split it up strategically into a uh, into a small sided tournament. Um, you know, try to. Uh, to build the most interesting teams that we can. And then depending on numbers, uh, I think have a uh, really competitive group stage then championship. And if you, if you have any input on who you would like to or not like to play with, just feel free to text or email. I was the oldest player last year and I'm hoping that that's not the case this year. And also just want to include players more than alums, more than welcome to come and, and coach and spectate. It is not mandatory that you play.
I don't know if John Kurganall is, is on the call. I can see him on the video, but I, I am my goal now is to make him a coach of one of the small sided teams, which would give them a huge advantage. Hold that. Hold that thought. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> Any other questions? Mike, is the spring schedule up on the website? It is, yeah. Yeah, we and we played one game before spring break, and then we've got um we've got two more home games, uh four more um uh, once we get back. Um so like the end of March to middle of April. Okay. Um yeah, and we'll get the fall schedule out as well, too. I mean, hopefully uh, get a chance to see some alums in, in different areas uh, as, as we get out and hit the road again. Mike, is that on the Davidson uh, website or is it a special website? I think we posted it on our Twitter. I'll see if they've updated the website. We'll have them update the, the website if they haven't done that. So so you go to the Davidson website and then look for soccer or athletics? Uh, for soccer on the athletics okay. page. Yeah, we right. and they should have the spring schedule up, but if they don't, I will, um, I'll have them update it. Okay. And I just think the mentorship thing is a good idea. And uh, if anyone's interested in medicine, I'll be happy to help. I've got your number, Lee. We can, uh, we will definitely. I'm, I'm sure you do. <laughs> we'll keep you in the loop for sure. Okay. I've got to but, sign off. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks, Lee. All right. Any others? We can. Um... Hey, Mike. Yeah. Hey. I played a couple of years down there and our spring schedule, uh, I can't wait to see it online, but we played like, you know, professional semi-pro Greek teams and all kinds of folks from uh, like Charlotte area. Are we playing like other colleges or are we playing like anybody who puts a team together to kind of fill out a six or seven game schedule? Because it was pretty wild when I was playing in the uh, early in terms of like the spring schedule. So um, it is interesting to hear your thoughts on the, the two season split kind of thing and how that may impact the guys and the travel and the intensity of the fall season and being spread out. So, um, you know, who y'all playing this spring? Uh, well, no, no kind of uh, rogue international teams or anything. We're playing all college teams. We're mostly local. So we played Queens right before spring break. They're division one now. And then um, we play Campbell, Elon, uh, Wofford, and uh, we play Wingate, the only uh, Division Two team. So all kind of within an hour or two. And uh, but you know, college, all college teams. Yeah, that's cool, and it's great to hear about the new initiatives there in terms of be building uh, a little bit more of the network out, and you know, trying to help these young men get to where they want to go, or if they know, and helping us alumni kind of live through them, uh, you know, vicariously and the glory years and whatnot. So as much as uh, I can be involved in Dave's and soccer, uh, I'll try to be. It's great to see you guys on the road always. And yeah. I'm always sporting the foam fingers, you know that. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, you're always easy, easy to find. But yeah, we'll, uh, and we'll be up, um, yeah, we'll be up playing at Mason uh, this year. So uh, Mason and VCU up in Virginia. So. Great. I'm sure we'll see you out there. All right. Any others? Um, and if any questions and follow up afterwards, feel free to, to email me. Um, happy to keep the conversation going. Um, and as much as you can, uh, you know, hopefully you can make it for the alumni game. And, uh, you know, if not, when we get some of these things going, um, you know, find ways to get you 
involved and connected with the team and and you know i think really tried to to build out the relationships that i think everyone that comes to davidson is is seeking and wants to be a part of and you know just being committed to establishing that that structure so that it can you know we can be the best at it and you know i think produce a lot of really meaningful connections and engagements and um for all of our guys past and present um but you know first and foremost really appreciate everyone showing up today and um you know hope to talk to see many of you soon go cats go cats thank we'll you see you guys thanks again thanks coach